Hi, everyone. Welcome to our very first virtual data bite. My name is Rigoberto Lara Guzman. I go by Chicano Cyborg Online, and my pronouns are they and he. I work as an event producer here at Data and Society, and I will be your host for tonight, supported by my team behind the digital curtain, CJ, Audrey, Eli, and Rona. For those of you who don't know us yet, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers and doers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. You can learn more about us through our website at datasociety.net. Spatially, Data and Society is located in what we now refer to as New York City a network of rivers and islands in the Atlantic Northeast, home to the ancestral unceded territory of the Leni Lenape people, including the Canarsie, uh, the Canarsie Band in South Brooklyn, where I am currently located. Um, I'm speaking to you from what's called Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, which is the lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, the Aquina Wampanoag, the Nipmuc, and the Massachusetts people. Um, and we've put up a link to nativeland.ca that can help you learn more, uh, more about that. So Sasha, you and I first met in Detroit in, at the 2018 Allied Media Conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, I have personally been uh, co-building with the Design Justice Network. Um, and it's just, I want to can say enough how much of an honor it is for me to be sharing this space with you. You are a visionary organizer, a scholar, a designer, uh, and it's just wonderful to be in virtual solidarity here with you tonight. Um, we were going to launch into just a simple uh, question, which uh, <clears throat> gets us into a little bit of the context of the book. And the question is, what is design justice? What is the origin story of this book? Yeah, thank you, Rigo. Um, it's, it's really, I'm, I'm really happy to be here in this conversation with you as well. So um, to me, design justice is a framework for analysis about how the design of socio-technical systems influences the distribution of benefits and burdens between various groups of people. Um, and in particular, it's an approach that focuses very explicitly and openly on how design of objects, of interfaces, of the built environment, of systems, of services may reproduce and or challenge the matrix of domination. The term from Patricia Hill Collins in her classic text Black feminist thought, um, which she uses to talk about the intersection of white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, ableism, settler colonialism, and uh, migratory status, citizenship status, and other forms of structural and historical inequality. And in the book, I spend a lot of time sort of talking about the, um, the intellectual lineage of some of the concepts um, in the design justice framework, but also it's not just an academic exercise or a way of thinking, um, because design justice is also a growing community of practice, a community of practice that focuses on the more equitable distribution of design's benefits and burdens, more meaningful participation in design processes and decisions, and especially on recognition of community-based indigenous and diasporic design traditions, knowledge and practices. And of course, design justice is not a term that I created. It's a term that comes out of this community of practice. So, you know, I'll get a little bit more into that in a moment, but there wouldn't be any design justice theory or practice uh, without the design justice network organizers, especially folks like Una Lee, Victoria Barnett, Wes Taylor, Denise Shante Brown, 
Carlos Garcia, Nancy Kalela Mutiti, Daniel Albert, Victor Moore, Ebony Dumas, uh, and so many, many other people who've been part of creating the Design Justice Network and growing this community uh, over the last several years. Um, I think it's also worth emphasizing that this is a community that's made up not only of people who think of themselves as professional design practitioners, but uh, people who, yes, are designers, but also people who participate in and work with social movements and community-based organizations across the United States and around the world. And it's a community that includes designers and software developers, architects, uh, technologists, journalists, community organizers, activists, researchers, uh, everyday people um, who got concerned with how design processes and design decisions um, are playing out. And uh, many folks are affiliated loosely with the Design Justice Network. Some are just signatories to our principles. And some, like yourself, are involved in organizing local nodes in the Design Justice Network that are now operating in different cities and locations um, around the US and around the world. Um, that, that, that instance of the Design Justice Network you know, comes out of the Allied Media Conference. It was born really in 2016. And you know, the Allied Media Conference is really uh, this amazing space of several thousand media makers and cultural organizers and activists and techies and designers who get together uh, every summer in Detroit. It's been going on for about 20 years. Um, and it's organized according to uh, into tracks and practice spaces and network gatherings. And the Design Justice Network was really um, born back in 2016, that summer, when a group of 30 people took part in a workshop called Generating Shared Principles for Design Justice. And the goal of that workshop was to move beyond the frames of social impact design or design for good or human-centered design to challenge people working on design processes to think about how good intentions are not necessarily enough to ensure that design processes and practices are really tools for liberation and to develop together principles that might help practitioners avoid what is often an unwitting reproduction of existing inequalities. And so, um, at that workshop in 2016, people came up with the seeds for what would later become the Design Justice Network principles. And um, I thought it would be good to really kick off our conversation by just uh, sharing those principles. And maybe that's something that um, you and I could do together. So oh, I, would I would love that. Thank you. So I was thinking I'll just, I'll read the first one and then you read the second one. Okay, um, and we'll okay. just go back and forth until they're done. And there's, there's 10 of them. Okay, I'm ready. So principle one, we use design to sustain, heal, and empower our communities, as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. Number two, we center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. Number three, we prioritize design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer, because we know where good intentions lead. Number four, we view change as emergent from an accountable, accessible, and collaborative process, rather than as a point at the end of a process. Number five, we see the role of the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert. Six, we believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience and that we all have unique and brilliant contributions to bring to a design process. I love this one. Uh, number seven, we share design knowledge and tools with our communities. Number eight, we work towards sustainable, community-led, and controlled outcomes. Number nine, 
we work towards non-exploitative solutions that reconnect us to the earth and to each other. And the last one. Number 10. Before seeking new design solutions, we look for what is already working at the community level. We honor and uplift traditional indigenous and local knowledge and practices. So thank you for reading those with me. And for those who are uh, watching the stream, if these resonate with you, um, you can learn more about them at uh, designjustice.org. And you can sign on to them as well um, at designjustice.org slash network principles. And I guess the last thing I'll say about this first question um, about, you know, where did this come from and how do I think about it? So, you know, we just emphasized the history of the network and where it came from and how it was developed and these principles that many of us are working by. Um, in the book, it's kind of a mix of my own experience working within that network over time, mm -hmm. my own reading of existing, you know, design theory and practice because there are many um, people who have tried over time to think about how design can be used um, for, for liberation uh, rather than to perpetuate oppression. And I sort of think about it through also my own lived experience um, as a trans feminine person and also my own experience as an educator. Um, so for example, I have a chapter which is about pedagogy and thinking about how do we teach and learn design justice in a classroom context. That part is drawn from my own experience teaching a collaborative design studio at MIT. Um, but really each chapter has a mix of sort of what's happening in this community of practice, um, what does design theory have to say, and then some aspect that's, that I'm drawing from my own experience. Thank you so much for sharing that brief presentation, Sasha. Um, there's so much to unpack in this book. And I think it would be appropriate to begin with uh, a question about how the book emerges um, because you've list you've named already so many people so many contributors and I was just wondering your thoughts um, on the importance of forming communities of practice what is a community of practice and then why is it important to establish these intellectual kinship bonds through design justice yeah I mean I think that the theory um, theory without practice is, is not that useful uh, and also probably doesn't hew that closely to ground truth. So I think that a lot of the ideas that we're working with in the network and certainly the ideas that influence me the most come out of particular social movement contexts, come out of particular communities that have organized and struggled against forms of structural and historical oppression. Um, obviously, the book draws really heavily on Black feminist thought, on uh, trans liberation theories, on um, intersectional feminism, uh, and on many other sort of uh, genealogies of radical thought that, um, that have always been tied to community organizing and to liberation movements, um, as well as uh, to designers and design communities um, and the ways that designers over time have tried to um, theorize their practice, um, especially those who are connected to, say, uh, you know, labor movements or other types of, of social movements. And I think um, in terms of sort of, you know, intellectual kinship and histories, of course, design justice is a new iteration, maybe, um, of many other intersecting and overlapping ways of thinking about how to do design better. Um, so for example, um, I'm really influenced by, by this book by Arturo Escobar. This is called uh, Designs for the Pluriverse. Um, and it's um, a really phenomenal, uh, the subtitle is Radical Inter Interdependence, Autonomy and the Making of Worlds. And the idea of creating a world where many worlds fit, which of course comes from the slogan of the Zapatista movement, um, is one that has really been influential uh, for me personally, and that's why the subtitle you know, of my book and the ways that I'm thinking about what it is that we're trying to do um, is, is never about finding the one way, uh, the, one, the one perfect design ring to rule them all. Um, mm. Instead, it's about how do we fragment that um, global monoculture, that vision uh, of top-down you know, perfect control and open up space 
um, for building many different types of worlds. Um, you know, there's, there's this history of, you know, folks like Victor Papanek, who wrote this book, Design for the Real World. Um, and this is about human ecology and social change. And I think there's a lot of really powerful ideas in here as well. Um, he and his students were interested in how do you redesign objects using, um, you know, locally available materials? Um, how do you rethink and reimagine what it means to innovate and design um, through a process that can actually delink people from the necessity to um, replicate locally what global transnational firms are telling people they need to do and adopt? Um, you know, that said, you know, he's, he's, you know, this book barely mentions, you know, gender and race. It does mention disability a little bit. Um, but I think that there's a lot of important concepts in here that we can, we can build on. Um, and I actually think that most recently, like we're living in a moment where there's an, a profusion, an explosion of really phenomenal design practice and theory um, that's trying to engage with concepts of structural and systematic inequality along race, class, and gender lines. Um, you've got great books like um, Cat Holmes' Mismatch, um, How Inclusion Shapes Design, um, where you know Cat is really trying to encourage people um, to not think about like, you know, to abandon the, the idea of edge cases and oh, we don't really need to pay attention to this small subset of the human population when we're building our product because you know uh, that, that that won't affect very many people um, and she's saying no we need to think about how if we um, design around the so-called edge cases in fact what we're doing is building objects and systems and interfaces that are far more uh, resilient and um, I'm really inspired by that um, I love this book Technically Wrong. Uh, this is by Sarah Walker Bucker. Um, and the subtitle is Sexist Apps, Biased Algorithms, and Other Threats of Toxic Tech. So there's just, there's just so much happening right now. Value-sensitive design. Um, this is a whole framework that was developed by Batya Friedman and others starting really, well, actually, I don't know when, it, when they first began. I've read stuff that was published in the 80s and 90s, and then now this is a new like synthesis of the work that's happened through the value sensitive design framework over time. No, you've touched on so many uh, beautiful concepts. Uh, the one that stands out, of, of course, is the idea of plurality and how do we make space for multiplicities to emerge, which is why I think the focus on uh, always working towards community and these intellectual kinship bonds is super important. Yeah, for sure. And I think in terms of like building a community of practice in the Design Justice Network, part of what we're really trying to do is have people connect with other um, folks who are inspired by the principles in, um, in what we call local nodes. And so that's, um, you know, the first local node was created in, in Toronto after we did a workshop there together with um, the Data Justice Lab and folks from the um, Black Sidewalk Coalition, where we were really looking at how Google's subsidiary, um, you know, Sidewalk Labs is trying, they've purchased an area of Toronto's waterfronts and they're trying to create their vision of a perfect smart city of the future. But their vision of a perfect smart city has, you know, robots are delivering all of the food through underground tunnels and there's no, um, the only workers are so-called knowledge workers. Um, and so their vision of sort of, you know, a utopia isn't something that a lot of us would want to live in, and it's certainly not something that admits, you know, working people and new immigrants and people who don't identify as high-skilled knowledge workers, you know, for tech firms. And so there's been a whole movement in Toronto um, to block sidewalk and push back on that particular plan, um, and also sort of thinking about how that type of vision of a smart, perfectly surveilled city relates to gentrification, displacement the recolonization of urban space, um, the erasure of communities of people who you know, built and carved out other types of worlds within the urban environment. Mm -hmm. and so by partnering with that sort of coalition, we were saying, oh, what, what does the, the, our principles and this 
approach to thinking about design. What does it have to say about city planning and design of the future? And since then, the Toronto Local Node has moved on to other activities. So they're, um, they're working on a zine about how to organize a local node and a bunch of other stuff. But that was a really great sort of tangible space to gather together um, and think about what does design justice mean in the context of what's happening in Toronto today. And I think that in different local nodes, people are exploring different issues, different areas, and building different types of coalitions um, in sort of this emergent community of practice. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if I could throw this question back to you a little bit around, you know, what's, what's happening in the new, in the New York um, process of forming, forming a local node? How's that been and what does community of practice mean to you all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we launched the New York City node uh, last year actually at Data and Society. So it was a wonderful gathering. Um, and right now I think we are working on developing capacity building um, so that we can we can extend like responsibility and um, develop momentum to to spark the the node. One of the issues, of course, in, in network building is always having enough capacity. And I think some of the things that you've you've mentioned and pointed out really speak to um, the importance of building trust with the people that you're building with so that you know some of the work can get done especially really a lot of it is administrative work that um, that needs to happen and so in order to sustain it you really have to have a sense of play pleasure and connectedness i love that the word cotorreo is still on the slides <laughs> um, during our conversation huh tell us about a cotorreo el cotorreo is is in espanol is like a like a hangout, you know, um, and that I love that it's in relationship to conversation because conversation is is a powerful tool for developing this, this trust and this kinship that I'm talking about. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a slow process, and <clears throat> I welcome anybody on this webinar and beyond who is interested in helping us build what a localized New York City design justice node can, can look like. Before moving on to this next uh, question, which I'm excited to get into with you, I, I wanna give a quick shout out to all the people on the Q&A function who have been naming their respective nations and also uh, giving homage to the lands that they are, uh, that they are on. Um, this question really came from reading about your experience with the TSA. And I was just curious when I was, as I was reading it, curious to explore this concept of deviance with you and how it is that it plays out in your everyday life, navigating socio-technical systems. Deviance and how it plays out in my life and, and in this book. Um, yeah, so as you said, the, um, the book, Design Justice, um, in the introduction, I begin with this story of my own experience navigating airport security systems and in particular the millimeter wave scanners. And I'm not going to recount the story here because it's in the book and you can read it. You can actually even read it um, for free on the um, Design Justice Pub Pub um, that I think maybe we could put that in the chat and into the Q&A because um, the MIT Press uh, has been making one chapter of the book available open access each month. And so we're now, uh, the intro and chapter one are available and pretty soon uh, chapter two is gonna drop and that's gonna keep happening for the next couple months. So you can read that story in more depth. I've also talked about it uh, at a couple recent talks, so I don't wanna really repeat it right now. Um, but in brief, um, when you go through the millimeter wave scanner, which is one that you step into and it spins around you like this after you put your arms up over your head and make a triangle. Um, a lot of cisgender people don't necessarily know, um, although a lot of trans and gender nonconforming people do know that on the other side of the millimeter wave scanner, the TSA agent is looking at you and visually just basically deciding whether they think that you are man or a woman 
and based on how they read you, they are pressing a little blue boy button or a little pink girl button, as you can see on the slide here. Um, and this is something that um, in the trans community people have been talking about for years, um, but it's only now starting to become more known and more visible um, to cis people. And so basically for me as a trans femme person, usually the TSA agent will read me an email, present the, uh, press the pink girl button, and then my groin area will get flagged by the millimeter wave scanner as anomalous because the data construct that it's comparing the scan of my body at millimeter resolution to, um, you know, I'm, I'm outside the parameters of a normative uh, female body. But if they press the, uh, maybe I'm presenting more masculine or maybe they just read me as male, um, if they press the blue boy button, then um, my chest area is going to get uh, flagged and highlighted in bright yellow uh, on the touch screen on the other side of the millimeter wave scanner. And so I use this as an example from my own lived experience of how this is a particular configuration of a socio-technical system that is designed to uh, erase, flag as risky, um, my particular form of body type deviance um, from normative cisgendered binary body type assumptions. Mm. And, um, and I also, you know, I talk, a little, I talk more about how that process works. Um, and, and I also, you know, I kind of use it to open up the conversation um, of design justice and, um, and of how the matrix of domination is kind of, of uh, white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, uh, cis normativity, uh, capitalism and settler, settler colonialism and ableism are constantly being reproduced through socio-technical systems. Um, so it's like a window for me. And I also really highlight in, in the book how this isn't something that's only a problem for trans or gender non-conforming people, right? Um, these, are, um, these are systems that um, also are biased systematically against Black people. So ProPublica has a story about Black women's hairstyles um, and how they're constantly flagged by the millimeter wave scanner. Um, Simone Brown in her book, Dark Matters, talks about how Sikh men, Muslim women, and others who wear head wraps constantly get uh, flagged. And Joy Bulamwini, who founded the Algorithmic Justice League, technically demonstrates how gender itself is always racialized already because humans have trained our machines to categorize faces and bodies as male and female through lenses tinted by the optics of white supremacy. Um, and of course, airport security is also systematically biased against people with disabilities who are gonna be flagged as risky if they have non-normative body shapes or if they use prostheses uh, and, and so on and so forth. And if you fall into more than one of these non-normative or deviant categories, then you're multiply burdened within the matrix of domination, and you're most likely to not only be flagged as risky, but then to suffer the worst harms from that flagging. And so I also talk about how, you know, all of us simultaneously occupy positions of privilege uh, and um, marginaliz marginalization within the matrix of domination, right? So um, because of my white skin and my MIT affiliation, my educational privilege and my US citizenship, when I get flagged, I don't have to worry about being, you know, hooded and taken away to a secret prison that's part of the global infrastructure of the so-called war on terror and disappeared without representation and all that type of stuff. Mm. Um, I might miss my flight or something. Mm. Thank you for modeling what multi-sidedness looks like um, what multi-sidedness knowledge production is um, you've cited so many people already and it's just a testament to me as someone who works in uh, an institute that is producing knowledge how important it is to be in community with those we cite as well i'm responding to your words a reservoir of relief um, i'm just curious given everything 
How are you replenishing your reservoir of, reservoir of relief at this moment? That's such a hard question. <laughs> um, really, this is the hard question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I don't know, yeah, just right now, it's, it's just so wild, like up and down, you know? It's like one moment I'll be like, uh, there's there's so much you know wonderful organizing and I feel so lucky you know to be in community with so many people whose work I really respect and be in those conversations and then another moment I'll just read some like new news report about the latest aspect of the unfolding current crisis which of course just dramatically magnifies all of the underlying structural crises that we already uh, live and I'll just get really um, down about it. So this is, this is hard. Um, but I would say, honestly, it, my only answer to this right now is the, the little like personal and everyday kind of things. So like I'm here um, with my family in our apartment and we kind of, um, we go for walks when it's sunny outside. So we spend a little bit of time outside. Um, that really helps a lot. Um, we also are attending different like arts events and online poetry readings and musical events and live streams and just kind of getting, you know, inspiration and relief from, um, from the work of artists and, and creators um, who are finding interesting ways to, to build community and share space and share creation, creation in this time. And then personally, I've also been, um, I've been spending some time making beats because I actually mm. used to do that a lot. Um, I, Hold on, did you say beats or beats? Beats, yeah, oh, electronic music. Um, so I, um, over here in the background, I don't know if you can see it, but this is, this is my, uh, this is my Kurzweil K2000 uh, sampling workstation. Um, Sick. And I've had it since the 90s and I've been, you know, when I'm just really down, I get back into taking some samples and making some rhythms. So you're a DJ for Design Justice and also a DJ. Let me find out. <laughs> um, thank you for answering that question. I, I wanted to make sure to, to leave a little bit of room for, for us to kind of field um, the vulnerabilities that are coming up for everyone right now. And, and speaking from a situated personal experience, um, as we ask this question now to our audience through this interactive that we're moving into next, dealing with experiences of erasure can be really painful. Um, and it's through sharing and speaking and naming them that we are able to access uh, a kind of resiliency together um, so Sasha and I were interested in uh, opening up the space a little bit, even though I can't see any one of you, uh, to, this, to this question of, is there a time uh, you can think of where you weren't seen by a computer system? It's such a fascinating question, and I'm super curious to explore the response to this. Again, feel free to use the Q&A function. Um, I, I, w I prompted you to give us a little bit more context about what that meant, but people are already responding in the Q&A. Um, I'll uplift one here from Brenda. Brenda says, when Siri couldn't understand my pronunciation with certain words that bring out my, sp my Spanish accent. Accents come, a lot, come up a lot in this conversation. Mm. Um, Erica Enomoto says, that Google art and culture app that aligns your face to a famous painting. Oof, that can get into some real trouble there. Um, Sasha, are you able to see the Q&A? Yeah, I can see it now. And I wanted, I wanted to shout out the one, I think it was from, is it Erica? They're, they're going away once they get answered, so I, I don't see the name anymore. But the Spanish language accent on Siri, um, absolutely. And I would encourage everybody to take a look um, at this project by the Algorithmic Justice League and Joy Bulamwini called Voicing Erasure that just dropped um, the other week. Um, it's at ajlunited.org slash voicing dash erasure. 
and it's basically a, a poem that I had the honor of being invited to participate in, um, which draws attention to the way that recent research that demonstrates um, systematic disparities in the way that voice recognition systems are able to deal with African American vernacular English. Um, well, that that's a thing, and that there's a recent paper that demonstrates that, but that the way that that was reported was actually done, it was reported in the New York Times, um, but the primary authors of the article, uh, many of who are women, uh, were none of them were cited in the reporting, so instead seven men were cited. Um, so the prose poem is Joy's response to both the study itself and the findings, as well as the way it was covered. People should definitely check it out. Again, that's ajlunited.org slash voicing dash erasure. And there's gonna be more happening with that project. Uh, and I, I see Joy in here in this Q&A and they're asking you for a beat. Maybe uh, at a future webinar, we can get uh, that DJ, Sasha Costanza Chuck. Maybe um, what we can do is we can save that one for the end and we can close it out with, um, I'll do a little beatbox at the very end. I love that, let's do that. Um, is this a relative of yours, Carol Chalk? Yes, hi, mom. Hey, <laughs> hola, mommy. <laughs> uh, every single frequent time I'm required to specify Mrs. or Mr. Um, that's your mom's experience. Mm -hmm. Here's one from, um, Aki Young, um, Akina Young, I did a Zoom call with a group of friends who are mostly black. And when we did the Zoom virtual backgrounds, I'm the lightest skinned person in the group and the virtual background worked for me, but not for my friends. Not direct erasure, but the erasure of my community of friends felt like an erasure of part of me. Wow, mm. thank you for sharing that example. That's a very powerful example. And that sounds like something that would be really interesting to follow up on and explore um, can we gather more instances of that? Can we um, make that public? Can we demonstrate to Zoom that along with the privacy concerns that they, um, much to their credit, I think, have actually recently announced that they were gonna put a lot of uh, resources into really focusing on fixing some of the worst um, aspects of their, the privacy aspects of the tool. Although, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical until we actually see how it comes together, um, but, in addition to that, they, it looks like they've got uh, a bunch of other um, forms of erasure that they need to be dealing with as well. Uh, shout out to MTP here uh, saying census forms not listing interaction, intersections of identity and asking to choose between identities, Afro-Caribbean and Chinese, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, f filling out forms can be such a trigger uh, mm -hmm. for many of us who do not fit within these boxes. That's for sure. Yeah, the census forms not having the intersections. Here's uh, Zana Fauzi. I'm a Muslim and a hijabi. I've always been asked to step aside in airports for a more thorough inspection because the scanner at the airports couldn't see what's inside my hijab. Um, mm -hmm. Rebecca Ackerman says my middle name gets autocorrected every time. I love Jumana Abu uh, Ghazale saying here, um, I'm Palestinian, Muslim, female. On many systems, I don't exist. Um, Ying Tang says my East Asian last name was once deemed invalid for an online membership sign up form. And Indy Young says when I type giveaway on my Android phone and it's autocorrected to get away. Interesting. Sasha, I'm curious if you can address a little bit this dichotomy between visibility and invisibility within socio-technical systems. Sometimes the only way we can get access to resources is to be visible to the state or to the system. Other mm -hmm. times we don't want to be so visible. How do you, how do you uh, approach that not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the short answer to this is that it's deeply contextual. So a lot of times when I give the talk about the millimeter wave scanners and trans erasure, you know, I'll always get that one engineer in the audience who will be like, well, you know, I can think about how we might need to retrain the system to be more inclusive of trans body types or something. Is that something that you would want to work on? My answer to that is always, no, I'm not interested in making more inclusive millimeter wave scanners for a variety of reasons, including, right. including that they don't, don't work for what they claim to be doing. Um, the 
TSA, TSA's you know, own audits, actually, sorry, Department of Homeland Security's own audits of the systems found um, that they were ineffective at detecting um, you know, weaponry and, and so on. Uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know the exact uh, stat right now off the top of my head, but they're fairly, they don't do what they're supposed to do. They serve more as what Bruce Schneier calls a security theater. Mm -hmm. So they make people feel like uh, something is being done to make them uh, feel quote unquote safe. Um, in fact, I think of them more as um, a border technology or a, te a technology uh, of empire. Um, and I really like, um, you know, to think about Harsha Walia's framework of undoing border imperialism. But I'm more interested in eliminating the need for these technologies in the first place or the presumed need for them. Um, I'm interested in um, ending uh, carceral forms of technology. I'm interested in, um, you know, decarceral technology. I'm interested in abolition. I'm interested in undoing, um, you know, uh, undoing border imperialism. Uh, and I'm not interested in inclusion in technologies of, of empire and border control. Um, that said, it's, yeah, it's contextual. So mm -hmm. sometimes we do want to be able to understand and see, you know, how many trans and gender non-conforming people are out there and how are we, are we able to make our way through uh, the employment system? Are we able to advance and be promoted? Or we might want to see that for women and femmes in general. Um, and if we don't have some forms of aggregate data, it becomes hard to make claims about widespread and systematic, you know, bias. So, um, yeah, inclusion depends on the context and this the system that you're talking about and and what the goal is ying tang saying my east asian ooh, these are moving really quick my east asian last name was once deemed quote invalid for an online membership sign up form so often what, what we're witnessing here is it's not that the the forms themselves are biased but that the people who are in the back end uh creating the standards for these forms um, are showing us a little bit of their biases. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about the, the design decisions that go into creating these forms that we then have to interact with? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that there's a lot of things that go into that. And part of it is exactly what you're describing, which is that unfortunately in the um, tech sector, um, there's still, you know, a chronic overrepresentation of uh, what Joy calls pale males, um, and the undersampled majority uh, are not participating in the design of these systems. Um, so there is certainly a lot of work that needs to be done that could fall under the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion umbrella. So how do we make these spaces uh, more inclusive? How do we build the pipeline? How do we make sure that hiring and retention and promotion happens? How do we set it up so that there's uh, capital available to um, non-normative founders who want to create new tech startups and get access to that? And I certainly think that all of that is important and support a lot of those efforts. I also, though, want to be careful uh, about allowing, you know, design justice is not just an argument for neoliberal inclusion uh, in a representational capacity in already existing processes of technology design and development in part because you could easily end up with a situation where you just have a bunch of pretty awful extractive ecologically devastating firms um, creating products for the global one percent who just happen to have more diverse development teams you know on them it doesn't change the dynamic of how are we organizing our priorities around what we need to design and build and develop and maybe right now the global pandemic is a moment where you can actually see the mask get stripped away and you can kind of see, um, well, yes, on the one hand, existing inequalities are playing out in really awful ways um, in terms of um, who's suffering the greatest harms um, from the pandemic and the response. But at the same time, what I'm trying to say is that you can see when we really need to, as a, as a species, we're able to kind of all gather and get together and say, oh, we need to organize as much of our resources as we possibly can towards dealing with this thing right now. And so suddenly there's massive amounts of resources and time and energy and investment 
in um, figuring out, you know, a vaccine and rapid testing and detection and contact tracing, which we can get into more, um, and everything else. Um, and so the priorities for uh, designing and prototyping and rolling out um, systems that are going to structure our lives, you know, they could be different. They could be other. We just have to understand, you know, we have to understand ecological devastation as a crisis that's actually on the scale up or larger um, than a pandemic. We have to understand, you know, gender and racial diversity as a crisis. It's on the scale of something like a global pandemic and we need to figure out how do we, how do we build and design and redesign systems um, to uh, reduce its incidence rather than to constantly replicate it. We have to think about uh, homelessness and poverty and hunger and food insecurity as crises on a scale of something like the pandemic and how would we redesign our systems so that those things are far less of a problem. We have the ability to do it and this shows us that that's the case. Um, we just need to not go back to quote unquote business as usual um, on the other side of this. Um, I'm really inspired by Arundhati Roy's article about the pandemic as a portal. Um, you know, it's a, it's a portal and we can choose whether we want to drag all of the matrix of domination through to the other side or we want to leave some of that baggage behind. Thank you everyone for uh, interacting with us through this Q&A function. I feel like we really hacked this, this Zoom function. And for sharing your experiences of erasure, um, that was really, really amazing. I was not expecting to receive so much engagement, but it just shows, um, I think, representative of, of the resonance that people are feeling, Sasha, to, to the book, to the ideas that we're setting up, uh, putting on the table. And, you know, as we are approaching the, the end of this webinar, um, I want to just talk about where you're at now at the stage of, of launching the book, what's coming up for you um, in terms of your next steps, in terms of uh, next steps for, for DJN. And um, yeah, what are, some, what are some things you want to leave us with before you drop that beat? Yeah, thanks so much. This has really been a pleasure. I wish we had like a lot more time because there's so many amazing questions that have been popped in the Q&A. Actually, maybe we could open a conversation with the hashtag Design Justice um, on Twitter, on Insta, on your favorite uh, platforms, um, and we could raise some of these questions there. I also would encourage people to connect with the Design Justice Network, um, in particular with, um, if you're in New York, connect with the local node uh, in New York City um, through being in touch with Rigo. How can, how can people connect to the NYC local node? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Chicano Cyborg, and just DM me and we'll make it happen. Cool, thank you. And I think in terms of, you know, next steps for me, I'm really excited um, to get into some more work actually with the Algorithmic Justice League. Um, so stay tuned for some, uh, for an announcement about what that's gonna look like um, coming up in the near future. Um, I'm also, I'm doing a lot of talks with the book. Um, so that's been kind of exciting and I'm trying to, you know, share those out on social media. Mostly I use Twitter. Um, so you can follow me there at S Chalk, S C H O C K. Um, and also um, everything that the network does, we're, we're sort of trying to share and be transparent. So you can learn more about the events in the network um, on the, on the website, designjustice.org. Um, and there, there's a lot, lot happening um, and it's distributed. So it's happening coming from the different, you know, local nodes. We have a new zine that's gonna drop this summer called uh, How to Organize a Local Design Justice Node, uh, among other goodies that are coming down the pipeline. So I'm pretty excited about all of that. Of course, at the moment we're just on, on COVID and dealing with this and we didn't really have a chance to get that deeply into it. Um, I think we're having a lot of conversations about what does a design justice approach mean for COVID and for so-called CovTech um, in particular, um, you know, proposals around how contact tracing is going to work, um, 
the different uh, privacy mechanisms for the apps, but also trying to break the frame a little bit and say, well, maybe the most effective contact tracing is actually it's about hiring enough people to do contact tracing effectively um, and not to automate it away. Maybe some, there's some combination that happens, but uh, it's a longer conversation. Um, and then there are just the proposals that are so, so awful. Um, like let's use face recognition um, to automate uh, contact you know, tracing or um, let's use uh, heat sensors from drones to um, automatically <laughs> track down uh, people with fevers and warn them despite the fact that we now know that um, such a high proportion of people are asymptomatic and even those who do have symptoms, fever is known as one of them on top of a whole bunch of other you know, questions about how that would work. So there's a lot to critique in the CovTech space, um, which isn't to say that there's no role uh, for new technologies, but I think, um, yeah, unfortunately we'll have to get into that in, in another conversation. And I will, I guess I'll just promise I would do it. So I guess I'll just end with a little <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again to our wonderful guest, Sasha Costanza Chuck. Her new book, Design Justice Community Led Practices to Build the Worlds We Need, is available digitally and via delivery. We welcome your feedback on this event. Check out our website and sign up for the Data and Society events list for future programming, uh, as well as our newsletter. I want to say again, muchas gracias, Sasha. Muchas gracias a todos y a todas. Uh, keep each other safe and have a wonderful night. Gracias, Rigo.